Presents the wonderful world of color. And now, from Walt Disney's wonderful world of color, we bring you a salute to Alaska. Now your host, Walt Disney. You know, just 100 years ago, Alaska was purchased by the United States. To help celebrate this centennial anniversary, we would like to give a salute to Alaska. The story of Alaska is somewhat told in its flag. The seven stars of the Big Dipper are a symbol of gold, and the eighth or north star stands for the most northern state in our union. Our 49th state got its name from a word used by natives of the Aleutian Islands, the Aleuts. They called it something like uh, Ali Exa. It meant great land or mainland. Very suitable too, for as you can see, we finally got a state much bigger than Texas. And although Alaska has been around a long time, very few people know the story of how our biggest star was born. About 250 years ago, map makers had a pretty good idea of what the world looked like around the Mediterranean Sea. By then, the eastern part of North America was beginning to take shape. But westward, the map makers had to use uncharted guesswork. Above and beyond, where Alaska is today, was a world cloaked in mystery, unknown, uncharted, and undiscovered. Meanwhile, over in Russia, Cossack fur trappers were trapping their way across the frozen plains of Siberia. Uh, my name is Ivan. I am Russian fur trapper. I have reached the Pacific Ocean. Beyond is a world cloaked in mystery, unknown, uncharted, and undiscovered. Uh -huh. uh, what's this? Strange animals stuck with spears washing ashore on the Kamchatka Peninsula. Could it be that Asia and America are connected together? This is good rumor to spread to St. Petersburg. My name is Peter the Great, Tsar of all the Russias. I think a lowly fur trapper desires to spread a rumor before me. Speech. He says strange animals, stuck with spears, are washing ashore on the Kamchatka Peninsula. And maybe Asia and America are connected together. Hmm. This is excellent rumor. I must find out for sure. My name is Vitus Bering. I talk like this because I'm Danish. The Tsar has hired me to find out if Asia and America are connected together. His orders are simple. Go to Kamchatka. Uh, Kamchatka. Kam Go there. Build a boat. Sail north along coast until I reach America. Early in 1725, we left St. Petersburg with many men, boats, food, saws, and a hammer and some nails. We passed Minsk and Moscow, Chelyabinsk, Omsk, Tomsk. We crossed thousands of frozen miles up the Lena River, over the Stanivoy Mountains, across the Sea of Okhotsk. 6,000 miles and two years later, we reach Kamchatka. Kamchatka. We got there. Where we spent a year and a half fashioning a ship from the dense forest. On July 9, 1728, we set sail to explore the mysterious unknown. We proceeded in an orderly fashion up the Siberian coast 
and to the east we saw only fog. Finding that Asia and America are not connected together, we returned to our base. We had accomplished the impossible. We did not discover Alaska. I returned to St. Petersburg to report my findings. My name is Anna, Tsarina Volderoshev. I am carrying on the great work of my uncle Peter the Good. Yeah, I mean, the good work of my uncle Peter the Great. <laughs> Any minute now, I'm expecting Captain Bering to return and tell me that Asia and America are not connected together and that he wants another chance to find the mysterious land what is lying to the east. <laughs> Good. Here I am, 13 years older. On St. Elias Day, I discovered a mountain and named it St. Elias. It was in Alaska. I then made an even more important discovery. Millions of sea otters. Yes, Bering's discovery of the sea otter proved to be even more important than his sighting of land. Thousands of Russian fur trappers poured across the Bering Straits into Alaska to hunt not only the sea otter, but the blue fox and the fur seal. The Russian-American fur industry flourished for about 100 years under the leadership of the Baranovs, Rezanovs, Shelikovs, and the Wrangells. Finally, the sea otter became almost extinct, and so did the fur trapper. To Russia, Alaska remained a liability for 41 long years. My name is Edward de Stock. Russian minister to the United States from America. If I play my cards right, I can dump this barren wasteland on the United States from America. My name is William Seward, United States Secretary of State. If I play my cards right, I can steal this northern paradise from Russia for a song. La, 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 la. Yet, two cents an acre. One cent. Two cents. One and a half cents. Two. One and three quarters. Two. 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 360 million acres, two cents an acre. That's exactly clearly seven million two hundred thousand dollars. What? When Congress heard that Seward had agreed to buy Alaska, it blew its top. They called it Seward's Folly, Seward's Icebox, Seward's Frozen Asset. In spite of congressional hostility, the Alaskan purchase was finally approved by a margin of one vote. On October 18, 1867, the stars and stripes were raised over the territory of Alaska for the first time. Then, for 30 years, Alaska lay neglected and forgotten under the northern lights. The Alaskan gold rush Yes, sir. I remember it just like it was yesterday. <laughs> That's me there. I was just 18, still wet behind the ears. These here newspaper headlines started the whole thing way back in 1897. Some reporter said a whole ton of gold had just arrived from the Klondike. Panic was on. This was the beginning of six crazy years of gold fever that took us greenhorn sourdoughs to such faraway places as Dawson City in Canada and Skagway, Nome, and Fairbanks in Alaska. When we arrived in Alaska, they piled us on barges, and we floated in with the tide. Our supplies was dumped for miles along the Alaskan beaches and tide flats. Some of the more patient stampeders took the long way around, by riverboat up the Yukon. But most of us was too much in a hurry. We had our choice of two shortcuts. If you could afford a dog team to haul your outfit, you used the White Pass route out of Skagway. The other shortcut was a killer, the Chilkoot Pass. Endless human chain. Sometimes we strapped as much as 150 pounds of supplies to our backs. We crawled, we dug, and we stumbled our way to the top. I can remember making this climb 10 times to get all my stuff up there. 
Boy, it was cold. At the Canadian border, there was always a fog or a blizzard. Hundreds of tent cities sprang up overnight. Along the beach at Nome, they started to put up some real honest-to-goodness fancy wooden buildings. Pretty soon, things began to look just like the streets back home. Believe it or not, we had newspapers and even newsboys peddling the stories about the easy millions being made every day at the digging. This was an early version of an Alaskan supermarket. The price of meat depended on how good a shot the butcher was. A mile of long woolen underwear was usually hanging out at Gertie Lowe's hand laundry. As you can see, she only hired experienced help. <laughs> this picture here shows a bunch of us getting ready to do a little prospecting. This is looking up El Dorado Creek, the richest valley in the Klondike. We heard once that $700 was washed out of just one pan of gravel. It wasn't all this easy, though. The cold winter months were spent piling up the frozen pay dirt. We sluiced it when the spring thaw brought us the water. Inch by inch, we burned and dug our way through the frozen ground. Sometimes we had to go down 40 feet to bedrock before we found the gold. Oh, it was hard work picking and scraping in those rat holes. In just a matter of weeks, all the early birds had staked out the good claims, so most of the late birds stumbled back to town complete failures. In order to earn the scratch to get back home, we hired ourselves out as miners, woodcutters, cooks, or handymen. There was plenty to see. It was like a 24-hour carnival. <laughs> Band, concert, dog sled races, and always some kind of a big parade. With a sourdough who was lucky enough to strike at Ritz, there was all sorts of temptations to part him from his poke. Plenty of wine, plenty of women, Lots of gambling. Slippery critters like Soapy Smith was lurking everywhere. Soapy was always surrounded by an army of thugs and tin horn gamblers. One good pistol shot by vigilante Frank Reed finally got Soapy his come up. And if you were prospecting on the Canadian side, you were protected by the Mounties. They wouldn't even let you carry a gun. They made sure all the saloons was closed on Sunday. With a little law and order, it was safe enough to bring your dust to the assay bank and have it melted into gold bricks. Of course, we stampeders didn't all end up being millionaires, but we sure helped prove that Mr. Seward's folly was a jackpot after all. Yep, we unlocked the door to our last frontier. We put Alaska on the map. On this historical day of January 3rd, 1959, President Dwight D. Eisenhower makes it official. A new state is born. A new star is added to our flag. This called for a real celebration. And the people of Alaska had been waiting a long time to let us hear about it. prospectors came to Alaska for gold. Today's adventure follows the same inland waterways on the modern auto ferry system. 
he looks for a different kind of gold. Boundless natural resources and breathtaking scenic beauty. The welcoming committee of totems and Chilkat dancers greet the Chichaco, the Indian word for newcomer or tourist. <laughs> totems tell the origin and folklore of the native families. They're sort of family trees, Indian style. This smooth marine highway up the panhandle has brought Alaska and the rest of the United States much closer together. Here the ferry reaches Ketchikan. They call it the salmon capital of the world. If you want a pleasure craft, you can share the new harbor with the fishing boats. The active fishing fleet has more than 2,500 boats. Since the earliest days, the largest part of Alaska's income has been harvested from the sea. for hundreds of savory salmon dinners. Alaskans swing in over $80 million worth of these salmon every year. And speaking of fish dinners, let's not forget the halibut. Over half of the halibut caught in the entire world are taken from these clear, icy waters. The fishermen use baited hooks just like the rest of us. However, their lines are five miles long. Another Alaskan delicacy is king crab. A total yearly catch of over 100 million pounds is not unusual. Nor is it unusual to have a single crab weigh as much as 25 pounds. Not as big, but just as tasty, are the tiny shrimp. In the thriving community of Petersburg, these crisp little local shrimp are so hard to stop eating that Alaskans call them Petersburg Peanuts. Much of the ferry's route passes through lumber country. Add up all the timber of the New England, Middle Atlantic, and Eastern Central States, and you get a pretty good idea of Alaska's timber resources. Millions upon millions of acres of rich, virgin forest land. of the commercial timber in Alaska is within two and a half miles of tidewater, a regular logger's dream. An Alaskan trip is a never-ending show. No one will ever forget his first sight of a glacier crashing its icebergs into the sea. stops is the city of Juneau. It was the first Alaskan settlement founded under the American flag just a dozen years after Seward's purchase. This was the site of Joe Juneau's fabulous gold strike. The mines are closed now, but the busy capital of this new state continues to prosper. Although fishing is big business, 
Many Alaskans fish on their holidays just for the fun of it. They're off and running for their favorite fishing spots on the first day of this fish rodeo. And there's a very good reason. First prize for the biggest king salmon may run as much as $3,000. into the boat. Well, the halibut wouldn't have qualified anyway. And there'll be another day tomorrow. North and west of the Panhandle, the rich coast of Alaska stretches on toward the Aleutian Islands. Here on the Alaskan Peninsula, they do a lot of fishing also. And it looks like these early settlers, the Alaskan brown bears, are having a salmon derby of their own. They ought to be good. They were at it long before anyone ever heard of Vitus Bering. As a matter of fact, some of these wise old boys might not do too badly in the salmon derby down at Juneau. winner for sure. Just like people fishermen, there are all kinds of techniques, and there's always one with no technique at all. Here's a really frantic effort sort of a salmon run to nowhere. This big fella doesn't even care. He just fishes because it feels good. A little way offshore, there's another crowd of natives, the sea otters. In 1911, an international treaty made it a crime to hunt them, and ever since, They've been lazily playing around in the kelp, cracking fresh crab and living the good life. Protected by law, the otters are increasing. But they have one enemy who knows no law, killer whales. And when they show up, it's every otter for himself. Mother otter loses no time getting Junior to shore. After all, he's part of the repopulation program. In the Bering Sea, north of the Aleutian chain, lie the Pribiloths. These fog-shrouded misty isles are the legendary breeding ground of the first seal. The seals, like the otters, were hunted almost to extinction. And the same agreement between Russia, Japan, Canada, and the United States. As I was about to say, the same international agreement protects the seals today. This nonchalant old sultan has many wives, so he's picked a spot where he can keep his eye on them. The seals are well on their way to a new population explosion. of Alaska are in wildlife, so too is the land. Mount McKinley National Park is an ideal spot for visitors to go hunting, with cameras only. One of the most spectacular shots is the annual caribou migration. These big fellows can be seen in no other national park in America. Other hunters are extremely interested in this migration too, and they are in camera fans.
If you look close, you may see a ptarmigan, the official state bird of Alaska. This is a pika. This is a young wolverine. And being a wolverine, you can bet he has something besides playing in mind. Like lunch. This old goat has plenty of kids to keep an eye on. too far from the rest of the crowd. The best way to photograph grizzly cubs is with a telephoto lens because Pop usually keeps a wary eye on them. Frontier Alaska has almost unlimited wildlife. And our great new state is making sure that this wonderful natural resource will be preserved for the future. In this huge land of Alaska, the greatest single problem has always been getting from one place to another. One man, Carl Ben Eilson, had the vision to realize that the airplane was the answer. He became Alaska's first bush pilot. With his World War I de Havilland biplane, he made the first airmail flight in 1924 and wrote Alaska's future in the sky. Next to take to the Crystal Air was Noel Wien. His pilot's license was authorized by Orville Wright himself. These historic films, taken in 1929, show the tremendous skill and daring of the first Alaskan bush pilots. This was the first flight ever attempted from Alaska to Siberia. Wien's mission was to find a fur ship locked in the ice and bring out the valuable cargo. Without radio, and so close to the pole his compass was almost useless, he flew for over six hours into the Arctic wastes and finally found the fur ship. He had to. The fuel for the return flight was on the stranded ship. Next morning, heavily overloaded with the valuable furs, he made the difficult flight back to Nome. Among the many bush pilots to follow was Bob Reeve, who started his own airways in 1933. In those early days, any likely mud flat became an airfield, and navigation was equally crude. Reeve used to say that he had a running light on each wingtip, and as long as he stayed between them, he was okay. To supply remote mountain camps, he landed on nearby glaciers and became known as the glacier pilot. Sometimes these landing fields weren't as solid as they appeared on the surface, but he used them for years with varying degrees of success. Getting out of these little predicaments was the true test of the bush pilot. As the years passed, the number of these pioneer pilots steadily increased. Their planes and flying skills improved, and they gradually bound Alaska together. The bush pilots performed a multitude of services, such as picking up cargoes of valuable furs from isolated outposts. They became Alaska's mailmen, newsboys, truck drivers, friends, and helpers. They carried anything they could cram into their planes or strap on. The roar of the bush pilot's low-flying plane dropping life-saving supplies is one sound that many a pioneering Alaskan will never forget. There will always be dog sleds in Alaska, but the huskies of the air make the long haul from civilization to the backcountry. The greatest boon of all is the saving of time. The sleds on the ice below are making their way to a remote village. It will take them many long, hard days. But in just a matter of hours, the bush pilot makes the dangerous trip to bring a desperately ill Eskimo boy out for medical help.
Alaskans are proud of the heritage of the bush pilots, and Alaska is the flyingest state in the Union. Today, Lake Hood, just outside Anchorage, is one of the largest centers of float plane traffic in the world. Alaskans use planes the way the people in the lower 48 states use automobiles. One out of every 55 adults has an airplane driver's license, including the Eskimos. Alaskan pilots the countless lakes and rivers, as well as the hundreds of miles of protected ocean waters in the Inland Passage, are all potential airfields. Also like automobiles, the planes are used for fun and recreation as well as business. A Sunday afternoon fly through the pleasant countryside is always relaxing, especially since the wide sky highways stretch out to the horizon in all directions and there are no Sunday traffic jams, stoplights, or horn honkers. This flying family decided to stop along the road and pick up some nice fresh fish for dinner. Even the half-pint husky decides to try his luck. Half-pint comes through. But as usual, it's mom who does the family shopping and picks up one big enough for everybody. Private shoppers with their big floats can handle lakes, rivers, mud, snow, or ice. They're perfect for holiday ski trips into backcountry for new powder snow that just couldn't be reached any other way. Just as the Alaskans have taken to the air, so too the giants of the air have taken to Alaska. Looking down at the top of the world, this polar map leaves no doubt as to the reason. Alaska is the true crossroads of the air world. And crossroad towns, like Anchorage, have a way of growing. High-rise buildings, hotels, restaurants, fine shops, and over 120,000 busy citizens. There are nine scheduled Alaskan airlines operating within the state. Seven of them were started by bush pilots. In addition, there are seven intercontinental jet airlines. Alaska is no longer isolated. is a bustling focal point of the air world. And as the commercial wings continue their upward climb, Alaska will go forward with them. This crossroad location at the top of the world also gives Alaska great strategic importance in the air age. The military growth has helped to expand and strengthen her economy in many ways. The distant early warning system, or dew line, is part of this program. These are the eyes and ears of our northernmost outpost. Also, the system has given Alaska communications in areas where telephone lines are impossible. These electronic eyes never close. They peer through storm, fog, and darkness. Ears that never sleep 
listen in the Arctic night. The Alaska Railroad was the first important link between the more easily settled coast and the interior. Beginning at the seaport of Seward, it follows the old sled dog trails through Anchorage, past Mount McKinley, and on to the city of Fairbanks. The railroad has been the lifeline of central Alaska. It moves freight as well as heavy machinery needed for industry. On this railroad, locomotive cow catchers are called moose catchers. Fairbanks is the northernmost station of the northernmost railroad in the northernmost state on the North American continent. Second only to Anchorage in size, Fairbanks is a busy modern city, but it does get cool in the winter. Right now it's eight degrees below zero. Just right for the finish of the main event of the annual winter carnival, an old-fashioned dog sled race. The dog on the sled isn't a spare, he's one that went lame. The rules are that the driver must finish the 30-mile grind with the same dogs he started with, even if he winds up pulling the sled himself. Here comes one who had two flats. This is an important event in rugged Alaska, and the winners are proud of their trophies, awarded by the Carnival Queen. Fairbanks is also the home of the University of Alaska. This isn't part of the Winter Carnival. It's just the Alaskan way of going from one class to another. At the Geophysical Institute, distinguished scientists are working and teaching. Dr. Sidney Chapman is probably the world's greatest authority on the Earth's magnetic disturbances. And Dr. Victor Hessler, professor in geophysics, has devoted much of his life to the study of the Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights. These rare films of the aurora were made by Dr. Kenneth C. Clark. Another unusual university activity is satellite tracking. This data acquisition site is perfectly situated for the polar orbiting satellite program which includes television pictures of cloud cover for weather studies around the world. Alaska looks to its bright future, and the future is in the hands of its youth. At the university, teachers and students are working for this future, exploring and developing the resources of their new state. Studies are being made of permafrost, the frozen ground which never thaws and which underlies much of the central plateau in the Arctic slope. This research is important to engineering construction and land use. This university experimental fur ranch is exploring the possibility of using fish waste as an inexpensive feed for valuable fur animals such as marten and mink. Muskox, too, are under study. They have a warm wool undercoat, finer than vicuna, and the university is trying to find the best way to raise them as a potential source of clothing and income. One of the largest university programs is in agriculture, and there is an experimental station in the lush Matanuska Valley near Anchorage. The opportunities for careers in agriculture are as big as the crops themselves. Long hours of summer sunlight and rich soil produce prize winners, like this giant Alaskan Brussels sprout. Well, it's really only a 61-pound cabbage. 
and the other crops are just as abundant. The teacher of this mining class dips into Alaska's history as he shows his students how the old sourdoughs used to pan for their folks of dust. Near Fairbanks, the class also has an unusual opportunity to study modern gold mining operations firsthand. Alaska has returned over $900 million in gold since Secretary Seward bought it for a little over $7 million. Even old Scrooge would have to admit, this was a pretty fair bargain. Here's a brick worth $35,000. However, there's an even more valuable kind of gold, the black gold of petroleum. A large pool lies under the waters of the Cook Inlet. And oil engineers turn to far off San Francisco for the construction of an enormous offshore drilling tower. This unwieldy giant was slowly towed up the inland passage. A strange new prospector following the same old pioneer trail to search for a new kind of wealth in Alaska. At the inlet location, the tower was filled with water, settling its tons of steel in place. And a drilling platform was added. The four legs are strong enough to buck the 30-foot tides of Cook Inlet large enough for eight wells to be drilled inside each leg. But there had to be a way to get the oil to storage tanks on shore in the face of tides, storms, and ice. A barge began to lay pipelines under seven miles of water to the tower. Welding, insulating, laying the pipe in a continuous operation as it moved. Alaska has never given up her riches easily, and now she tested these modern prospectors with a sudden storm. The vital pipelines began to bend as the barge dragged anchor. A call for help brought every available tug to the rescue. After hour through the night, the work went on. As the force of the storm and the current battered the barge, the tugs churned against it, fighting to keep the pipelines from snapping. By morning, the wind eased up a little, and the tugs began to straighten the pipe. The barge was able to resume its slow march to the tower. Then, with the coming of winter, nature again tested the strength and design of the tower. But in spite of the elements, the wells continued to deliver. The success of the first wells proved the new field. And with the addition of other platforms, oil production is growing, just as all of Alaska is on the upswing. But even with the rapid economic expansion of this new state, there are still primitive frontiers to conquer. Point Barrow is the northernmost tip of the continent. Here, visitors can still see the natives living as they always have. Coming of a plane is a great event. And these young mothers, like mothers the world over, are anxious to show off their babies. The heavy parkas are a good place to hide them from the cold. This far north, the long days of summer, are a time of fun and holiday. There are actually 82 days when the sun never dips below the horizon. The Eskimos are quick to laugh and celebrate while they can. Much of their hunting is done at this easier time of year, for these natives must still take all their food and clothing from the land if they are to survive. The 
the bear has his own ideas of survival. Yet even at this farthest outpost, deep within the Arctic Circle, scientists, the modern-day pioneers of Alaska, are searching for the unknown riches that lie under the snow and ice of the frozen land. Others study the sea to search out its secrets. Laboratories on drifting ice flows carry scientists still farther north to research the polar regions. Nowhere on Earth for a land of greater contrast, as old tradition mingles with the surge of progress. Alaska is a land of growth and opportunity for those who come to stay. But it is also a wonderful land to visit with its camping, fishing, recreation, wildlife, and its awe-inspiring scenic grandeur. Alaskans hold for their great new state is perhaps best described by the poet laureate of the North, Robert W. Service. Some say God was tired when he made it. Some say it's a fine land to shun. Maybe, but there's some as would trade it for no land on earth, and I'm one. It's the great big broad land way up yonder. It's the forests where silence has lease. It's the beauty that thrills me with wonder. It's the stillness that fills me with peace. Well, that's how the Alaskan star was born. It's a thrilling story, but still unfinished. The future will add many more thrilling chapters. Since Alaska, we've added our 50th star, Hawaii. But that's another story. Yeah.